So I'm very happy, very happy to welcome you all um, to what, um, despite the mistaken views of many, um, is undoubtedly the most important session of the World Economic Forum. And the fact that, that you're all here on Saturday afternoon instead of uh, skiing shows that you understand that. Very sensible people. Um, we have uh, this year, I think, a, tr a really remarkable panel. Um, uh, before I introduce you, let me just introduce you very briefly. To my left is Mr. Haruiko Kurodo, who is, of course, the governor of the Bank of Japan, and right at the moment, the most exciting central banker in the world. Um, we have had an extraordinary number of exciting central bankers, and almost as exciting is the man to his left, Mark Carney, um, who was, I was about to introduce as governor of the Bank of Canada, but <laughs> in fact is, of course, governor of the Bank of England. Uh, to his uh, left is Christine Lagarde, who has returns to this panel, managing director of the International Monetary Fund. To her left, uh, Monte Carlo Walia, uh, deputy chairman of the Planning Commission uh, in India, which really means he runs it, since the chairman is the prime minister and has other things to do. Um, <laughs> on his left, uh, is Larry Fink, uh, uh, founder and head, of course, of BlackRock and our private sector voice. I hope a very robust one. In fact, I'm confident of it. To his left, Mario Draghi, governor of uh, the European Central Bank. This is a very central bank heavy panel. And finally, we're delighted to have with us this year Wolfgang Schäuble, the finance minister of Germany, um, a decisive figure in the Eurozone um, story. Um, I just like, need to inform you that uh, Mr. Draghi has to leave at 2.30, so we are going to focus our earlier discussion very much on Europe, and then after he's gone, we'll move to the rest of the world, the bits of the world that really grow. Um, <laughs> right. Um, very brief background. Um, I think the general mood out there, uh, almost seven years after the, the crisis was seen to begin in the summer of 2007, is uh, some real optimism about the world economy on the real side. The IMF has just released updated forecasts which show um, growth, which indicate an expectation of growth of 3.7% in the world economy this year, up from 3% in 2013. Uh, with improvements quite general in the advanced countries, um, notably so in the US, 2.8% against 1.89% last year. The Eurozone actually with a, a percent of positive growth, which is quite a big change from years of decline. Um, emerging countries also growing more quickly, but uh, um, uh, up at 5.1%. But there's also obviously lots of things to be concerned about. Uh, the advanced economies are still enjoying, if you can use the word enjoying, a very weak recovery. All things continued almost seven years after the crisis I've mentioned. They've lost an immense amount of output relative to pre-crisis trends. There, and this is despite the most aggressive monetary policies conducted now over five or six years in history, free money. We are, there's still, there are concerns about deflationary um, um, pressures in US and even more the Eurozone. And this is against the backdrop against of real concerns about long run productivity growth and inequality. So there are big issues in the advanced economies, in the emerging economies, we've seen some market turmoil recently. Uh, there's questions about China slowdown, the way it's being handled, the end of the credit boom. So very big issues in this incredibly important a new superpower, China, and much pressure on other emerging economies. The questions of tapering, capital reversals, exchange rate volatility, uh, uh, commodity price weaknesses, and, uh, uh, and other real concerns about how emerging economies are going to sustain the really rapid growth and convergence we've seen. So general some optimism, but some real concerns. So that seems to me the background to these discussions. So I'm going to start now with, for a global overview uh, with you, Christine Lagarde. Thank you very much, Martin, for pretty much covering my subject. And uh, having quoted the IMF, I cannot blame you. 
but given what you've said, I will try to focus on my two other R's. My first R, which you've covered very well, is this uh, recovery that we are seeing, and that is really in consolidation process at the moment, happening at different uh, uh, rates in different areas, but with the, certainly the key news as being the advanced economies moving a bit further next, than expected, which is why we revised the emerging market economies with a slower momentum than we had thought, and low-income countries still going strongly and, and uh, an area uh, from which there is uh, quite a lot of hopes. So I will focus on my two other R's very quickly. Uh, the first of my, uh, sorry, the second R is risks. And uh, we are seeing here some of the old risks that have not yet been completely fixed. And uh, I, I'm sure that Mark will touch on that. The first one is this financial market reforms that are underway and which are not yet completed, which need to be completed. Uh, the second uh, risk that we still have on the horizon is, is this unbalanced uh, growth uh, that we are still seeing that has been fixed a bit as a result of uh, the slower recovery, but we're clearly with better recovery. We can see the unbalances between the different economies re-accelerating yet again. More interesting and probably more debatable as well, and debate has begun, are these uh, new risks that we are seeing. The one that has been talked about a bit is the issue of how tapering takes place, at which speed, how it is communicated, and what spillover it has what spillover effects it has on other economies, particularly the emerging market economies. We've seen a bit of that during the tapering talk of May. We've seen less of the downside effect, the, the spillover effects in December when it was very well announced by the Fed, but this is clearly a new risk on the horizon and it needs to be really watched. The second one, which is also debatable, and I'm sure we will discuss it, is the one that we've called a low probability, but yet a probability associated with it in the range, in our view and in our numbers of about 15, possibly 20% of deflation. And I'm going to qualify for a microsecond, uh, Martin, if, if, if I may. The deflation risk is that that would occur if there was a shock to those economies that are now going at low inflation rates and certainly way below targets. I don't think that anybody can dispute that particularly in the Eurozone at the moment, the inflation is certainly way below the target that it is normally associated with, which is close or at below 2%. So with that in mind and low expectation, low, sorry, low inflation for a period of time, the risk is that longer term expectations be anchored at a much lower level than it is currently associated with which is why the IMF has identified that as a potential risk. And the term deflation is coined with this long, longer term low inflation risk that we see with a shock to those economies. I hope I've made myself clear on a topic that is obviously a, a little bit complicated. My last R is reset. We're seeing as necessar necessary going forward a reset in the area of monetary policies. We believe that quantitative easing and the accommodating monetary policies that have been adopted so far should be continued up until such point where growth is well anchored in those economies, and this is not yet the case everywhere. Reset in the sense that once it is well anchored, then those accommodating monetary policies have to be reformulated, have to move either back into their old territories or be more traditional or be maybe of a different kind, and I'm sure central bankers around here will be able to comment on that, but that's first reset. Second reset is the one that Mark is, is I hope, going to talk about it, about, which is the financial sector reform and regulatory environment that is clearly undergoing a major reset at the moment. And the final reset, which is my last word, Martin, is those structural reforms that are necessary in all corners of the world. Very often people think structural reforms, okay, for some of those advanced economies that have such rigid labor markets. No, it's not just that. And I'm not sure that I would necessarily associate advanced economies with rigid markets, nor would I mark flexibility as the ideal solution for it. But structural reforms are needed in product markets, service markets, but they're also needed in emerging market economies where structural reforms can take a completely different form 
from those that I've just mentioned. And they have to do with bottlenecks in certain countries, they have to do with proper governance, and they certainly take multiple forms, including that of unleashing the potential that is there, but that is still constricted by a lot of licensing rights, protective barriers, and so on and so forth. I've finished with my three R's. The most important one of the three being the one that I've not commented on, but that you have eloquently commented on, which is R for recovery. I knew that I would give you, liberate you to focus on <laughs> the other matters, which actually I think are more important. Um, risks and reset. I'm going to turn now to Mario Draghi. Um, Inflation is uh, running at well under 1%, which is quite a long way from your target, though you have adroitly set it at close to but below. We don't know what close to means. Maybe this is close. Doesn't look close to me. Uh, there's uh, a real issue about deflation uh, concerns, and the possibility of a negative shock is always there. So um, is your monetary policy failing? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to ski, by the way, when I leave. Um, the, um, yes, I, I agree. The uh, inflation is uh, uh, subdued, and it's expected to remain so over our forecast horizon now, which is about two years. The, it's going to stay on the low level of our target range, I would say on the very low level, for a protracted period of time. Now, the, we are aware that the longer stays at low level, the more serious would be the risk of deflation. And, um, and so we are ready, as, uh, as we said in a recent press conference, we are ready and willing to act if needed. The issue is, uh, is there deflation? Or is it, how likely is deflation? Well, if you define deflation as a broad-based fall in prices, where you have self-feeding expectations of further falls in prices, broad-based across goods, across sectors, across countries, we don't have that in the euro area. The inflation expectations, medium-term inflation expectations, remain firmly anchored at 2%. So let me try to give a little perspective to this, uh, to this phenomenon which are, we are experiencing in the euro area. The, first of all, when you look at, well, you know that some of this low inflation is due to global factors like the low price of energy and food. Because after all, when you look at inflation in the United States, it's not that much higher than it is in Europe. Second, when you look at core inflation, and you uh, look back a few years back, you see that core inflation now is at the same level as it was in 1999, at the end of the Asian crisis, and as it was in 2009, at the end of the Lehman crisis. So it's quite clear that financial crises of this magnitude are often followed by a period of low inflation. The, but also, the other interesting thing that, that we've done is to look through the core inflation numbers. And we see that the decline in core inflation is entirely due to the decline in inflation in the four program countries, Greece, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland, almost entirely. Now, this suggests that some of this low inflation that we see in the euro area is actually due, due to a relative price adjustment, and therefore, it's bound to end. That's why we think that in the medium term, inflation will go up to a level which is close to 2%. So that is the, uh, that is the perspective we are trying, we are trying to uh, have in looking at, uh, at this phenomenon. And uh, it's clearly a mixture of the effect of low, uh, low demand, high unemployment, but also there is a very important component of relative price adjustment, which is fortunately good because these four countries are also the countries that look first 
in terms of structural reforms, what they did in the last two years, and their growth prospects have improved substantially. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't respond to your point. What are you gonna do about that with your monetary policy? Well, I have to be, um, I don't wanna discuss in, uh, in detail single instruments of monetary policy. But one thing one should keep in mind is that instruments depend on the contingencies that you face. We might have two risks or two contingencies that we may have to cope in the, in the near future. One is an unwanted tightening of our monetary policy, of our monetary conditions in the euro area. Unwanted tightening could come from the short-term money market rates tightening, spreading through the yield curve to the medium term. And then you have the other contingency, which is, a sad, which is the one Christine was hinted, hinting at before, which is a sudden worsening of the inflation outlook for the medium term. And the instruments are gonna be different, depending on what contingency, it's quite, it's quite clear. So let me, do, let me say, in concluding this, let me say that our accommodative monetary policy will remain so, the interest rate rates will stay at the present or lower level for an extended period of time. And if any of these contingencies were to uh, happen, we are ready and willing to use all the instruments that our treaty allows. Thank you. Would you like to enlarge on that last one? <laughs> Not really. Buying bonds. <laughs> Not really. Not really, because, because you, know, you know what happens. If, if I discuss one specific instrument, the day after, markets are convinced that that's the instrument that figures as number one in our list. But uh, if I'm, I, I actually, I'm a little forward to what, I mean, I'm trying to be forward into your needs. And uh, so I'll make a little effort on one specific point, because I know that in everybody's minds is QE, is the magic word by which everything would be fixed in the euro area. Now, I don't think anyone is suggesting that actually, to be fair to them. Okay, good. I'm not saying that it should be done or shouldn't be done, but let me tell you one thing. First of all, we have a treaty that says that prohibits monetary financing. So we, are, we don't have a guilt program like in the UK, we don't have a bond, government bond program like in Japan or in the United States. Second, when people think about private sector assets, um, then they should know what they talk about. Uh, our financial markets in the euro area are 80% banking markets. Capital markets are actually going very well. Corporate issuance has gone up, and even bank bonds issuance has gone up. So there is no need to do something in that, in that sector, in that field. So what other assets would we buy? We would, I mean, one thing is buying bank loans. Would you buy bank loans today? So the issue is, uh, and, and the issue for further thinking in the future is to have an asset which would capture and package bank loans in the proper way. Right now, securitization is pretty, I would say, dead. ABS are not an instrument that is at the present time feasible. It might become so if regulation on this front will distinguish between ABS that are plain vanilla, that is to say easy to understand and price and trade and rate, from ABSs which are highly structured, opaque, which basically are being banned from the market forever, at least I wish so. Thank you very much. I think the implications of what you have to say are pretty clear. I'd like to, because you're just about to go, there's one other issue that I'd just like to raise, which is the asset quality review. And basically, very simple question. I don't want to go into the details of this. I think people really want to feel after many, what, is, what are seen as failed attempts, that at the end of this process, we can have total confidence or as near total as you can ever have in a real economy, in the stability of what is in fact the world's most important banking market. Yes, that is exactly our objective. The objective, first and foremost, the, the objective, most important objective of our asset quality review is to shed light on what is in the bank's balance sheets. 
it's transparency. That's why it is a process that is being set up right now, and it's driven and should be driven in an operationally effective and completely transparent fashion. Even the process itself should be transparent. That's why we, we have started a series of communications to the industry uh, every month or so. We communicate all the parameters and the developments of this process. It's so important, not only for the private investors, that in order to put money in the banking industry, they ought to know what's there. But it's important also for our monetary policy transmission channel. Because one of the realities we saw, we witnessed in the last uh, two years, is that when we changed the interest rates, when we cut interest rates, this was immediately translated into lower lending rates uh, by the banks operating in the core countries, and not by all of them. And uh, not so in the banks operating in the non-core countries, in the periphery. Now, the situation has considerably improved. On the funding side today, we are, by and large, as far as deposits are concerned, bank deposits are concerned, in the same situation as we were in 2007. On the lending side, the spread between lending rates in the core countries and in the non-core countries has decreased, but not at all by as much as the funding rate. So the AQR is very important to assess what is the exact health what is the actual health of the banking system and therefore improve our transmission monetary policy channel. Thank you very much. May I move to you, uh, Finance Minister Schäuble? Um, do you share the optimism about the uh, recovery, uh, regained deep uh, stability of the Eurozone and recovery? And also, how do you see the German economy in that context? I do share. Uh, first of all, I, I think we <clears throat> are good. Of course, <clears throat> I have to add uh, to what uh, Mario Draghi just said. Uh, Europe is a little bit different to uh, other regions because we have one monetary policy, but we have still uh, 18 different uh, fiscal and uh, economic policies slightly different fiscal and monetary uh, and, and uh, economic policy. And that makes things a little bit more complicated. And that is the reason we have to avoid any wrong incentives, because the temptation not to stick to the needed uh, decisions in fiscal and economic policy, structural reforms and so on, is uh, very high if you have one monetary policy, one central bank and 18 several nation states. That makes uh, the Eurozone a little bit complicated. Having said this, I think um, the Eurozone overall is uh, not longer the main, it, it, it's, it's the center of all the concerns of the world economy, the stability of the world economy. That's fine. I, I, I remember the, the last couple of years when it was a little bit different. And I think we have uh, better regained confidence in the euro and in the, in, the, in the fact that the euro will remain a reliable currency and an, an important European currency. And the European member states, the all European nation states will stick to the European integration and to the European uh, common currency. And that will remain a major currency all over the world. That is, that is decided, and no one uh, wants to change this, and it will not change. We have, uh, it is a broad consensus. And on this basis, we have solved the problem, by the way. We did it in, in this program, as it was highly disputed in the last couple of years. But if you see, the most successful member states in Europe are members under program, because they delivered what, they, what has to be delivered. Ireland was very well. Portugal is doing very well. Spain did extremely well. Greece did much better than everyone expected two years ago, to, to be very frank. Cyprus, by the way, is doing very well. Slovenia they, does not need a program. I remember all the, all the discussions I got the last couple of years. And therefore, we have uh, 
uh, the euro is stable, we have regained confidence, and now we are working on, on this very difficult issue of building a banking union. Of course, we are limited to the given treaty. We can discuss what we would uh, like to have for and try to change it, but as long as we have no change, we are all born. That is, a, that is the principle of any, of any state with the rule of law and, and democracy, that we are bound to the given legal basis, and that is, in Europe, that's a treaty. And uh, this means um, we, we, are build, we, we have taken the, the decisions to build, we have a common uh, European banking supervision. We have uh, the, the legal basis for the, the single supervisory mechanism. We have uh, harmonized rules on, on the saving directives. We have agreed on uh, restructuring, uh, 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 the rules for restructuring with clear rules uh, for bail-in for, for the future. In the framework of the single market, we have, this all has to fit with the rules for a single market with 28 member states, 18 member states of the Eurozone, but uh, a single market for 28 member states and that has to fit with this. The rules for, for bail-in, and now in, in December we agreed on a single resolution mechanism, including a resolution fund which has to be financed by the industry itself. That can only be delivered under the, under the, under the uh, uh, obligation of the member states because the member states are the only who can imply a levy. Of course, the European levy is fine, but you need a legal basis. You have not a, secure, a, a safe legal basis. Therefore, you have to rely on a national levy and you have to, uh, to, find a, to build a European fund by intergovernment agreements. That's the only sound legal basis we are doing. And as long as it's not, it's not fully paid in, the national member state had to take uh, liability that it will be paid in because the only one who, I as German member of uh, a government and German member of parliament, I cannot oblige uh, Italian banks to pay the levy. I can only oblige the German banks to pay the levy, therefore member states have to be involved until it is. That will happen, that we will, we will find this rule and then we have all what is needed uh, that the uh, ECB or by the ECB can take the banking supervision for the all relevant, uh, uh, systemic relevant or cross-border European banks. And this will work. I'm quite com uh, confident that we will achieve this. And that will, additional, uh, that will uh, further stabilize the Eurozone as a whole. Of course, we have to continue to stick on structural reforms. That is the most important thing. I'm very glad you got the, that bit at the end. I know, Mario, you have to leave. Thank you very, very much. Um, See you on Monday. Said very important things. I'm going to get away from developed countries uh, at this stage, um, because after all, they're only about 12% of the world population. So um, I'm going to turn to you, Monte Kalawalia. Um, how does the world economy look to you from India and as you see in other emerging economies? And uh, the change environment in the developed world, change in interest rates, possible rises over the next year or two, how well are these countries positioned? And there's a particular issue obviously about India. There's a quite broadly based sense that growth has disappointed now for some time, um, improving a little this year. What's gone wrong and how can it be fixed? Thanks, Martin. Um, first on the global bit, let me just say I agree with Christine's what I would call cautiously optimistic outlook, which I think most people share. There's no doubt that after two years of pretty bad news, everybody's agreed that the, this current year is going to be better. Now, from the developing country's point of view, I think we have to recognize that this uh, recovery is quite different from the ones after the first crisis. Because actually, uh, most of the growth, most of the additional growth in the world is not coming from the developing countries. It's really coming from the recovery in the industrialized countries. The developing countries are doing a little better, and certainly their average growth rate is higher than industrialized countries. But this is not the world of the two-speed recovery that we all enjoyed so much, especially in the developing countries. Now you have to ask yourself, why has that happened? And my guess is that the answer is different for different countries. I mean, the most important country, of course, is China. 
it looks as if it's stabilizing at 7.5%. But you know, this is exactly what the Chinese targeted. I mean, the Chinese 12th five-year plan targeted a 7.5% growth. And uh, since the world was very keen to do rebalancing, you might say that, well, while they're growing slower, that's more or less according to their plan and according to the global plan. So nothing much, I mean, lots of problems about how they're gonna manage it, and that, that's true. But the slowing down is actually as per plan. Now, India is different. I mean, we benefited from the two-speed recovery uh, in the sense that, you know, for about seven or eight years before the Lehman Brothers crisis, India grew at 8%. Then we went down, but you know, we recovered very quickly and the average growth rate in the three years after the first crisis was pretty much the same as the average growth rate in the previous seven years. That's not what has happened. I mean, we slowed down this time in 2011, but then in 2012, we slowed down further and 2013 looks about the same. So I think you're right to ask, and certainly we've been asking in India, why has that happened? To go down from 8% to 5%. Now, our central bank governor, Raghuram Rajan, sort of offered what I think is quite a good back of the envelope calculation. I mean, he's made it clear, and the government has also made it clear, that we never said that the slowdown in India is only because of the global crisis. I mean, the government said, well, partly global, partly domestic constraints. Raghu's put some numbers to that, which is very catchy. So one third due to the global, two thirds because of domestic constraints. So actually, I think that's quite a reasonable breakup. And the government knows that we've run into domestic structural constraints. Now, how do you address them? There are many different aspects of structural reform. Uh, for the last year, the government's been trying to address those. Probably the most immediate are really uh, regulatory clearances which had somehow slowed down. Maybe the system wasn't transparent enough. There was more concern uh, reacting, if you like, maybe to some environmental activism, some judicial activism. And as a result, many large projects just did slow down. And I think that is what the government is focusing on. I believe that we have actually given a large number of clearances. We need to do a little more in the sense that we need to make it systemically an easier thing, not just giving some clearances. And I believe that that is, that is going to happen. Uh, many other reforms are really in the pipeline, especially in the financial sector. Uh, and I think these will get uh, rolled out over the next year or so. So my feeling is that uh, the, the, the IMF rightly has projected a higher growth for India in 2014, about half a percent higher uh, than in the previous year. I believe that if the structural reforms that we are talking about uh, do get implemented, then the acceleration will be more than that. Now, of course, the most important thing that's going to happen in India is the general election three months from now. And, you know, inevitably, investors and business interests will be looking at that. Now, I don't like thinking of the election as a risk or an uncertainty, although that's what financial analysts do. I mean, the fact is 750 million people are going to exercise their franchise in a completely free and open vote. And if you go back on Indian elections in the past, I mean, we've, we've seen this happen before, and I think each time the broad consensus on policy has survived. So I think there's a lot which is in the pipeline. It can't be done in, in the last three months of an election. And what the present government is doing is implementing what is possible within the law. There's a whole lot else which could come very quickly. And personally, I think that India could get back. I would have said seven and a half, eight percent over a two or three year period. And that we have to work hard at it. And that's where I think Christine rightly said that structural reform is not just something that industrialized countries have to do. Uh, we have to do a lot. It's different from what the industrialized countries have to do. And you also asked me about uh, how do we look at all these uncertainties the taper, et cetera. Now, clearly, uh, in a highly interconnected world, uh, there will be uh, spillover effects. Hopefully, they'll be better managed. There's some evidence, by the way, that uh, these multilateral discussions or plurilateral discussions are having some effect. I mean, there's no doubt that when uh, Mr. Bernanke first made a statement about the taper, actually, there's nothing wrong with his statement, but the market reacted very adversely and very precipitously. 
One reason, by the way, was that the global economy wasn't in good shape at that time. Uh, were, I mean, certainly in India's case, we had lots of weaknesses that were then evident. So my feeling is that A, it's been better managed. There's a great assurance that it, it won't be something suddenly inflicted on the system. Mario's just indicated that if there is any undue restriction, other central banks will do something which might offset that. And I feel that while interconnection is there, probably well-managed economies will be able to withstand the shock. And you know, India's experience is interesting because last year, April, April of last year, when the uh, reversal took place, the Indian currency was b badly hit. Uh, at that time, many of the things that I'm talking about, setting the system right, were not yet in place. The previous year, we had a current account deficit of 4.8% of GDP. Now it's less than two and a half. So, and, the, and the currency has moved a teeny bit, but not very much. So I think that the risk is there, but I think well-managed emerging market countries will be able to handle it. Thanks. So, cautious optimism. I'm going to move now to, I think, the most exciting monetary experiment at the moment, um, the, the first arrow of Abinomics um, under uh, uh, Haruiko Kuroda, um, whom I've known for 40 years. <laughs> and uh, congratulations on... Uh, uh, the job you're doing. So tell me, tell us about um, the return of inflation to Japan. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, the current government started a new policy regime called uh, Abenomics, which consists of, as you said, uh, three arrows, aggressive monetary easing, flexible monetary policy, and substantial structural reforms in various sectors. Uh, about uh, 12 months have passed. Economy has rebounded very strongly. Actually, uh, the Japanese economy has been growing close to 3% uh, in the last uh, 12 months or so. The Bank of Japan introduced uh, a new uh, monetary policy framework called quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, or QQE, last uh, April. Nine months have passed, and inflation rate uh, nine months ago was still negative, but now it's positive 1.2%, and even consumer price inflation uh, excluding all uh, food stuff and energy items reached recently positive 0.6%, which is the highest in the last 15 years. So uh, I must say that uh, the Abenomics as a whole uh, is making progress, and in particular, uh, the monetary policy has been achieving significant uh, progress toward the 2% uh, inflation target, uh, which should be achieved basically within two years' time. Only nine months pass, uh, so we have uh, still uh, plenty of time to reach the 2% inflation target, and I'm quite sure that uh, the economy with, uh, with sustained growth uh, supported by flexible fiscal policy, as well as uh, uh, substantial uh, structural reforms, uh, would uh, uh, be able to bring about uh, 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 discontinuation of deflation. Deflation continued in Japan for nearly 15 years. Mild deflation, yes, on average, uh, negative uh, half a percentage point or something, but deflation created a uh, very negative uh, 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 mindset in Japan because uh, corporations uh, having uh, their profit uh, dwindling uh, didn't invest in uh, fixing, uh, fixed uh, assets or, or technology or human capital and also uh, 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 didn't uh, raise wages. And the household sector, of course, uh, uh, 
their uh, income doing, was dwindling year after year, and uh, prices uh, declining, so that they simply spend less and less. So that uh, prices continue to decline. So this was a kind of deflationary uh, cycle, uh, vicious cycle. And through this uh, deflationary uh, vicious cycle, uh, innovation uh, was, uh, was uh, not very strong. And, uh, and the investment in fixed uh, asset, as well as uh, human capital, uh, has been very uh, slow. Now the situation has completely changed, and uh, uh, I'm quite uh, 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 optimistic uh, as far as uh, the economic growth and, and uh, appropriate 2% uh, 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 inflation are concerned, they would be achieved. But uh, we are only halfway, okay. only halfway. So there is still a long way to go. Uh, so uh, we have to be uh, mindful that there could be downside risk, upside risk from within the country or from abroad. And by the way, I would like to just remind uh, all of you that the Bank of Japan Monetary Policy Committee meet 14 times a year, more than once a month. Uh, while I understand the uh, FOMC uh, meets uh, eight times a year. So we have plenty of opportunities to assess the outcome of the economy and uh, the, 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 the forecast of our economy, and if necessary, could adjust our monetary policy uh, either way. I think one of the most fascinating aspects of this remarkable experiment is that uh, most economists, I suppose probably 99%, <laughs> think that a determined central bank can create inflation if it wants to. It has a, Japan has a determined central bank, so we'll find very soon whether this is the case. Um, until very recently, nobody would really have questioned this. Um, Mark Carney, um, let's start with the UK. Uh, you can look a little broad, more broadly if you want. Um, you came to this completely beaten up economy which suddenly <laughs> has revived in this, in this wonderful way. It's wonderful what credit does to the British. And uh, I, I read in some papers that as a result your thrilling new policy of guidance has failed. Um, <laughs> you might want yeah. to respond on that point and more broadly set the scene for monetary policy making in a possible exit-ish sort of context, or what many people out there think mm. with a rapidly recovering economy might be an exit setting. Okay, uh, thank you, Martin. Um, it's a neutral question. Uh, very neutral. Um, uh, it's a testament to uh, how things have moved since we were on the uh, panel last year that you can almost ask that question with a straight face. Um, uh, so, couple, yes, a couple case, words. In my case, it's not a very straight not face. Not a very straight <laughs> face. Uh, a couple words on um, the UK recovery. Um, three factors, uh, wisdom of hindsight, three factors drove uh, the, the, the pickup in the UK, which has been quite marked. Um, first, um, accumulated uh, debt pay down by uh, British households, uh, more than 20 percentage points of income, and that in an environment of very low nominal income growth, so more impressive uh, even than it sounds. Uh, secondly, uh, financial sector repair. Um, if you look at the top 50 banks in the world, uh, they have raised half a billion US dollars of equity since the crisis. The major banks and building societies in the UK have raised 140 billion pounds of that total. So that gives you a sense of the order of magnitude of the repair of the core of the financial system, and, and full credit to uh, my predecessor and his colleagues for doing that and, and encouraging that. And I would say the third thing uh, that helped, um, and it's, it's the least tangible, but is uh, a reduction in uncertainty. Uh, part of that is uh, a few years ago, Montag uh, had the great analogy of confidence. Uh, it grows at the rate of a, a coconut tree and, and falls at the rate of the coconut. Well, it's been the slow uh, growth uh, of the tree in the UK, helped by developments in Europe, very much so, uh, helped on progress of the financial system, and to move to monetary policy, we would say helped by forward guidance and additional clarity uh, uh, that it provided. Um, and the clarity was first and foremost around when the recovery comes, 
the bank is not going to immediately withdraw monetary policy stimulus. Um, so let's talk about failure. Um, inflation is 2% on target for the first time in five years. So kuroda san is coming uh, to his 2% target very impressively uh, from below. Uh, we were coming to the target uh, from above. Um, uh, we're back on target. Um, the fastest rate of grob, uh, job creation since records began, now a little less impressive than that sounds because records began in 1971 for, you didn't count jobs in the UK before, it didn't matter before then. Um, uh, Actually, <laughs> the unemployment rate was one and a half to two percent, who cared? Well, it's We had a proper labour market once. Well, that's, that also goes to one of the issues, which is the relative level of uncertainty around supply, which we can get into, but let me, let me go to your broader question because I think you want to discuss um, the reset, if you will, that uh, Christine raised around uh, monetary policy. Uh, and and let, me, let me put one, one bit of context here uh, in terms of the risks as well, which is we, are, we have been in a very low volatility environment, uh, uh, in part, uh, and maybe in large part, because of the policies of the major central banks. Um, so there's two dynamics here. One is to move back to a more normal volatility environment, which will feel like a big increase in volatility, um, and then potentially move farther than that because of the, some of the structural changes in the financial system that Larry and others are better placed than I to, to, uh, to talk about. Um, in terms of uh, exit, and I am not, I am not signaling an exit uh, UK monetary policy here, just to be clear. Um, we have uh, our first phase of forward guidance uh, with a 7% threshold for the unemployment uh, rate um, is approaching, and we don't know exactly when, but approaching uh, the achievement of that threshold. We will assess the overall conditions in the labor market more broadly, uh, supply capacity and its impact on inflation in the economy, just as we've said all along that we would do at that point, uh, and set policy appropriately. Um, we have already given some additional guidance on monetary policy. We've already said there's no immediate need to raise interest rates, this environment. Uh, and even when that point comes, um, which could be, uh, well, I, I won't put a, a time on it, uh, but even when that point comes, any such increase would be gradual. I think the interesting thing from a global economy perspective is why would it be gradual? Where's the, and I'm sorry to use jargon with a big crowd, uh, where's the real equilibrium interest rate in the global economy? How much below that do we have to run monetary policy effectively, uh, which is what we're doing right now in the United Kingdom, what the Fed is doing, what the Bank of Japan is doing, and others, uh, in order to provide the exceptional monetary policy stimulus that is still required to maintain uh, momentum in these economies. And I'll finish with this, is that as good as the numbers have been uh, in the last three quarters in the United Kingdom, uh, we're talking really about three quarters of household-led growth um, an economy that's running 20% uh, below uh, pre-crisis trends, uh, that has substantial uh, spare capacity, uh, that, that has not yet rebalanced, um, and that faces significant heads, headwinds from its major trading partner, uh, from overall monetary conditions, uh, including the exchange rate, um, and still the residual of balance sheet repair both in, for households, the public sector, and the financial sector, and in that environment, uh, exceptional stimulus remains very relevant. Okay, that's, I think, about as clear as you can get. Um, Larry Fink, last word on this, and then we'll go to the audience, I think. Um, you might want to say a word or two on the U.S. Everybody's very bullish. Uh, the general view is optimistic, I think. Optimi <clears throat> um, although not by the standards of a normal recovery, but by the standards of recent performance of the U.S. and other economies. But I'd be particularly interested in your view on what's happening in the financial sector and the risks there. Could there be, we've had a low volatility world. Are we moving now, looking at what's going on right now, into a high volatility world? What should we be worried about from your view as, uh, from your very particular vantage point? Thank you, Martin. Well, first, the U.S. economy is going to do fine. Banking system's in good shape. Uh, we're not experiencing the deleveraging that Europe is experiencing. Uh, we have a robust capital market that anybody could come to the market who wishes to come to the market, which is a major differential between all other regions of the world. 
uh, and then we have this energy sector that it is just transforming the entire U.S. economy. So the U.S. economy is going to grow 3 plus percent, but it's not going to grow much faster. There's still a lot of drags within the economy, but so overall, uh, I think the, uh, related to the overall markets, um, I think we all entered the uh, financial crisis with a lot of worries, and yet after the financial crisis, markets more than doubled, um, and every pundit was negative, and um, I just hear way too much optimism now going forward. Um, I think the experience of the marketplace of, uh, this past week is going to be indicative of this entire year. I think we're going to be in a world of much greater volatility. Um, and that doesn't mean we end up in a bad place, because I do agree with all the tonality of what has been being discussed here, because, uh, because I do think the overall trend is going to be fine, but there's going to be quite a bit of disruptions. I think the, the marketplace has been very um, encouraged by what I would say good, consistent monetary policy across the world. However, for global economies to go forward, it's going to require quite a bit of governmental policy, fiscal policy, politics. We're going to have to be dependent on the execution from the Chinese on their reforms. We're going to actually have to be not looking towards Kurodasan in Japan, but we're going to have to be looking towards Abe-san on, on the reforms in Japan. We're going to have to be looking for the reforms in the United States. We're going to have to be looking for all these reforms in every other place. That troubles me because there has been a, a, a great consistency of dragging their feet by politicians. I think one of the main reasons why politicians today are struggling with, I would say, directness to their populate is we all are talking about the financial crisis and this jobless recovery. And it is, from our opinion, the jobless recovery is a multitude of reasons among we had excess housing and so much, so much employment was in formal housing in the United States. In Europe and in the United States, we are, we've actually contracted fiscally to become, and we call it austerity, which has created much fewer federal jobs and state jobs. But then most importantly that we don't discuss enough is the, is the macro changes in technology and the impact of jobs, and especially the impact of jobs in the agricultural area, where it's ripping apart jobs very quickly. And and so a main reason why we're seeing rising economies but stubbornly tough labor markets, we're going through another macro transition, and that's the transmission of going from chiefly unskilled jobs to a need for uh, more skilled jobs. And this transition is going to take some time, and so it's very hard to tell those men and women, whether, whether they're in India or in the United States or in Italy, that you know, it's, you know, it's going to be harder for one to get a job. And so this is why I worry about the capital markets this year, because these are hard discussions to have. They take time. We can't be dependent on monetary policy. And I think these, this is going to be a little more, um, it's going to take a, quite a bit more time. And, but, but overall, I think the markets are going to be fine with just a lot of volatility, Martin. So, and the volatility is due, just to be very clear, a change in perceived monetary environment, um, yeah. over leveraging of the environment that has been created by central banks, this incredibly easy money environment, so the downside, just to make clear what, what you think is going to drive this, obviously to many people somewhat disturbing notion of a really quite volatile market. Well, I think the market has been so accustomed to rising equity markets the last three years, it's been very easy to have those trends. I think my biggest fear in the marketplace, and we saw it very clearly the last three days, there are so many correlated trades. Mm. So many people are long the DK, short the yen, uh, and have, and have you know, large positions in various emerging markets, and now you're seeing an unwinding of it. I find it very interesting when I t talk to a lot of governmental officials, they're very happy when capital rushes in, and then they start yelling at capitalism when, when, when capital rushes out. 
but we're going to have that behavior, and, and unfortunately, it's going to require much better domestic policy in all these countries. And I think in some of the emerging world where we're starting to see a lot of stresses, we should not, I think there's just too much narrative on, on tapering as a cause of the unrest. By and large, a lot of the unrest is just bad domestic policy in some of these countries and over-dependency on China. And so it's a convenient excuse to say tapering is the cause of all, gov all global evils. Uh, it's just not. <laughs> On the assumption that nobody wants desperately to disagree with anything anybody has said, if they would want to, you, I'd really like to hear it, it would be fun. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask, allow people in the audience to ask a few questions. We won't have much time. Be very brief, very disciplined. Say who you are and say who you want to address the question to. Uh, I'll take, start with the front row. There's somebody here. Could you stand up if you want? They won't see you otherwise, please. If that's possible, right. Who are Hi. you? David Serra from Andrew Briss Investments. Um, I hear the US is doing very well and Europe and Japan is recovering. But when I look at the 10, 20, 30 year exchange rate, average dollar yen 130 is today 103, and average dollar euro, we created 118, is today 135. So what I don't understand, how is it possible that the US is doing so well and still the exchange rate of Europe and Japan are significantly higher compared to the US over the last 10, 20 years? Can someone explain it to me? That's perhaps why the US is doing so well. I will, <laughs> sorry. It is. I didn't mean that. I will come to that question. That's a very good question, which of course Larry will be able to answer to you at a, in a blink. Um, somebody at the back. Uh, there's a lady in the middle there. It's all about four rows back. Could you stand up, please? Then they'll find you. Um, could you pass the microphone, please? Catherine Benold from the New York Times. I have a question for Minister Schäuble. Now that we have a coalition government in Germany, which means you have a big majority in parliament, do you think that there's an opening for moving towards a mutualization of debt in Europe, something like Eurobonds in the next coming years? I'm glad somebody asked that question. <laughs> so, is there somebody right at the back? I can't see anyone right at the back. There, okay, there's a lady here on the left-hand side. Just stand up, please, so they can find you. Yes, please. Yes, uh, Deborah Berling from O Globo, the Brazilian newspaper. I would like just to pick up on what Mrs. Uh, Lagarde uh, said uh, and to see if you could develop more, and maybe India could t talk about it too, on how tapering uh, takes place and uh, more on the spillover uh, in the emerging world. And if you agree that the countries affected will be because of bad policy, as Mr. Fink said. Okay, um, first question, if the US is doing so great, why is the dollar so weak? Larry, do you want to take that one on? <laughs> I've never uh, understood exchange no, markets, I, I, so I'm I happy actually to think the US has been a big beneficiary of a weak dollar. Right. Um, I, think, uh, I think governmental officials historically always stood up to a strong currency. I think the rhetoric has been more muted. I still think when they're pushed to the wall, they, t they always talk about the concept of a strong currency. Um, but I think the overwhelming reason is if you add up all the, the amount of money the Federal Reserve spent on quantitative easing, it just overwhelmed everybody else's monetary policy. Uh, and a flood of currency worldwide has created a, a weakened currency. And I, don't, I think it's pretty simple. Um, and, um, it, and it proved to be a good, successful strategy for the U.S. in having that. Nevertheless, I do believe um, a 136 euro, from my vantage point, um, is in my mind unsustainable. Um, I think Europe needs a weaker currency to to to, um, to really expand on this this potential economic growth, um, and I think when we'll see that when you start beginning to see more aggressive tapering over the next year, and if there's any need for policy response by the ECB, I would think you would see a much weaker euro over the course of the next year. Mr. Schäuble, I don't know whether you would like to comment on the desirability of a weaker euro. Um, <laughs> 
I am not uh, I responsible no, for I this. Expect Mario you Draghi has left, if you have seen. Sorry? Mario Draghi has left. Yes. Um, he could answer, he could react, me not. However, there was a question addressed to you, which is whether you feel now or in the future, possibly in new, after a new treaty, that the mutualization of debt, euro bonds, or anything of that kind is conceivable, and if so, in what circumstances? If I got the question right, the question was whether a broader majority for the act uh, oh, well, Because you have a broader majority, that allows but, you to consider but, ideas but like the matter that. of mutualization of debts in Europe is not a matter of the, which majority is supporting the German government. By the way, we continue as a German government because we were very su successful in last election. Uh, but the, the matter of mutualization of debt is if the, in the given European structure, construction with what we have, the a legal basis in, in the given treaties, with national fiscal policies, if you want to give up any hope on structural reforms, ongoing structural reforms in, in Europe, you have to mutualize debt. Because as soon as you can take debts on the risk of others, you, you will not get support in any parliament for the always uncomfortable but needed structural reforms. Therefore, in the given European structure, without any treaty change, mutualization of debts would, would be the end of any structural reform and the end of the way of success we, we, we exceed, succeeded the last couple of years. Therefore, we will do not. So, in other words, uh, it helps if they're all on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, the tapering. You can join us in working for treaty changes. It's difficult to get in Europe. I that think we, we will I have a more common fiscal policy. Then we can move. But as long as we don't have, we can't. I have a sort of feeling that the British might not sign up to that treaty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would, um, be, I would be ready to invite you, Chaos. Um, You're very welcome. Impact of tapering on emerging economies. Christine Lagarde, would you like to add anything to the, on your perception of the risks there, as has been mentioned? Because it's already been discussed at some length. Yeah, just, just briefly, maybe follow up uh, from what uh, Wolfgang um, just said. It's also true that if very well done, as is recommended by Mario Draghi, a good balance sheet assessment of all banks mm. and a good stress test would also participate in the building up of what would be needed for some mutualization of debt. So that's a good necessary steps for all sorts of reasons, including that one. On the, um, the spillover effects on, on emerging market economies of, the, um, of tapering, what we have seen in May has been much talked about. The actual flow of capitals has not been that big, number one. Number two, what we've also seen is that not all emerging markets have been affected in the same way. And in that way, markets and investors are very cunning. They look at the fundamentals of economies. They look at the strength of government. They look at the predictability of policies. They look at the policy mix, and then they decide to move in to stay or to move out. And there are countries that have had hardly any currency movement, and there are countries that have seen significant currency movements as a result of the talk of, ta the talk of tapering and then subsequently the announcement in December. But clearly what has happened in between May and December has been very beneficial to some of the countries. And India is a clear example of monetary policies as well as a reaffirmation of fiscal policies that have had an impact on how prepared the Indian economy is. That's just a for instance because Montec is here. It's true. Thank you very much. There's just one final thing I'd just like to touch very briefly on with you, Mark Carney. It's the, 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 because we've got, we're sort of getting to the end of the great re-regulation, <laughs> transform regulation of the yeah. global financial system. And, of course, we believe completely that, therefore, when your work is completed, the FSB, we will have a completely robust, sound, crisis-proof financial system. Yep. Um, would, you would you be prepared to give us that assurance? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think what I'm prepared to uh, say is that, um, 
First off, uh, one observation, great that nobody asked the question about it, uh, which is a sign of progress, uh, number one. It will allow greater focus on the bigger secular trends that Larry raised and Montag uh, raised and Christine. Um, but just in terms of the agenda for 2014, as, uh, as uh, Prime Minister uh, Abbott of Australia uh, outlined on this stage, um, the focus is going to be to complete the job in terms of all the main aspects, remaining main aspects of financial reform. So that's things left on Basel III. We made a lot of progress in the last two weeks. Uh, it's the core element of uh, uh, ending too big to fail, which is basically a structure for bail-inable debt across all the major institutions and changing those derivative markets, and also uh, changing the economics and the mutual recognition of regulation within derivative markets. Uh, those three legs uh, drive completing the uh, job. Of course, It'll always be with us, um, but the focus uh, from 2015 on, if we do our job this year, will be much more about implementation and iteration, uh, and the last word means uh, understanding unintended consequences, making changes as we did to the leverage ratio, to the liquidity coverage ratio, in order to ensure that they don't have unintended consequences, whether it's for emerging markets or for capital markets. And you're, you're reasonably comfortable with the idea that in terms of the capital that the, the firms will have, the, the, the handling of market risks, derivatives, um, all the rest of it. We globally, you know, this was an agenda set in play, motion in 2009, yes. and it's a big way, a big thing, that we, because we're not going to do much more of this in a sense, it's crisis, that you have sort of basically done the necessary job. By you, I mean you and your colleagues in the FSB. I think the, I think we have, by, increasing capital requirements sevenfold uh, by changing the fundamental structure of derivative markets, funding markets, uh, and, uh, and a whole new approach to liquidity and risk management. We have put in place the minimum standards necessary. I do think that the home markets uh, in, in several cases, including the United Kingdom, uh, need to supplement those uh, as appropriate. Uh, but in a way that's consistent with the global approach. La, uh, Christine, yes, would, you, would you agree? I, I, I agree with Mark, and I think that a great job has been done. But because that great job has been done, there's also been a significant increase of the shadow banking world, yeah. Yeah. particularly in the United States of America really sure. and in China mm -hmm. as well. So that's, that's an area where I hope the FSB will continue to pay attention. Montek, do you want to say really brief? Very brief. Uh, no, I think the FSB has done a great job and we've been part of it. But I, I, there are areas of concern. I mean, the principal area of concern among emerging markets is it's going to introduce a very strong home bias amongst the international banks. And that will not necessarily be to the advantage of the offshore part of their balance sheet, which actually in many cases may actually be stronger than the onshore, but they, it'll suffer. That's point number one. Point number two is, I think the concern about liquidity is actually going to limit the maturity transformation that banks can do, which may be good from a stability point of view, and it's probably not a bad idea where you have capital markets. But many of the developing countries don't have strong capital markets. I guess the answer is we've got to develop them quickly. But those are two areas of real concern. This is obviously not a panel on financial regulation, it's just such a big issue. Larry, very, any brief, really brief comment on this? I agree with Mark. I mean, I, I think the fundamentals of uh, regulation is is in place. Um, I agree with Montag quite a bit, though. I think um, we have we are going we are struggling. The, in, in some economies, it's struggling now by changing the uh, maturity profiles of banks, and more importantly, we didn't talk about maturity profiles of insurance companies due to solvency too. That. One of the big structural issues why infrastructure investing has been so anemic is due to um, the movement towards annual evaluation of, of volatility, and therefore we are actually causing much greater problems in, in the developing world because there's just not enough long-term capital. And final, what you've got the last I, word. I would like to, to just to add a more general remark, reminding what Larry uh, says said before, our problems in labor markets don't result from the financial crisis. They, they, yeah. they, they result from the dramatic change in technology. Oh, and God. it's similar with the regulation. In the globalization, with increasing volatility, that will go on. We will need more regulation. We will, and the problem is who is regulated, because we have no global regulator. 
We, we have only, and it's difficult to get, and therefore we have uh, to think about that we will, in, in the globalized world, we need better regulation, and not only for financial markets, but also for financial markets. I'm going to give Mr. Kuroda, it appears, <laughs> the last word. I think uh, we can be cautiously optimistic about the global economic outlook. First, U.S. economy is likely to grow by 3% plus this year as well as next year. Europe is finally recovering, growing, and Japan also making significant progress. And emerging economies like India, as well as China, Indonesia, and others, uh, their economic growth rate is likely to be maintained at high level or likely to accelerate. So I think we have to be, of course, cautious. We have to be always mindful of downside risks. But I think we can be cautiously optimistic about the global economic outlook. I think uh, <laughs> you, you have given the summary that I would otherwise have given. Um, and that's relevant to the sort of market gyrations we're seeing. The strong view of, on the panel is that Maybe this is a bit overdone. We're going to have a lot of volatility, but basically the world economy is recovering at last and not looking too bad despite all the local difficulties. As I always remark in these conclusions, and we've, the last couple of years we've had this sort of uh, situation, um, it's as optimism grows that risks also grow. And I think one has to re always remember that. But uh, my reading of this panel is they're not optimistic enough to be really dangerous. <laughs> so, so I think I'm going, to go with, I'm going to go with the conclusion of the panel, which was, I think, an immensely thorough review of, all the, of all, uh, pretty well all the issues. And I want to thank the panel very, very much for giving you and us this oversight. Thank you.